my name is Dick Russick, uh, and uh, we have a son that has gone through and used most of Wildwood's uh, services. And he is now 44 years old, um, and um, I'm Ginny's husband. <laughs> I am Ginny. <laughs> I'm his wife. Um, and David's mother. Yes, David is now 44 years old. And in the very beginning, there were no services for David or any of the others like David. And so we simply joined with a number of other families um, and decided that it was going to have to be our role to get those services developed. My name is Isabel D'Ambrosi, and my son Keith lives at 12 Gay Street uh, in Del Mar, one of Wildwood's houses. And um, because Keith is part of Wildwood family, he has a life. It's been an interesting journey and has introduced all of us to some really wonderful people. Hi, my name is Kathy Cohen, and my son, his name is Michael Cohen. Michael is 36 years old and is living in Albany, New York. He lives um, on Morris Street. He's very proud of that. Um, like the other parents that we've met, to, to, you know, that you've been introduced to, uh, Michael has also gone through most every one of Weldon's programs and continues to do so. So it's been a great journey. Hi, I'm Martha Delano. Lori is my daughter. She's 42. Started with Wildwood when she was seven and has gone right through all the programs, forerunner of many of the programs because she was one of the older ones and they, they didn't have a program that worked, Wildwood developed one and that's kind of the way it's been uh, all, all through it for her. But she's at Del Mar, she's, which is a group home, Wildwood's second group home that they started. She's been there for 19 years already and uh, she has two homes. She has our home and Del Mar and she loves them both. Hi, my name is Nancy Huber. My son Kevin is 35. He has been involved with Wildwood since he's been about three and a half years old. Um, he's now in an apartment with a roommate. Staff comes in and checks on him once or twice a week. Very independent young man. Because of David, as I said earlier, and because of our need for support and to not to have to continue feeling like we were the only parents in the world with a David or a person who had the struggles and challenges that David, David had and therefore that we had, um, we reached out to others. Part of that reaching out was going to a parent support meeting in Albany um, at what was then called the Street Policy Association, now known as the Center for Disabled. And there had been a very small group of parents who had been meeting under the auspices of the Cerebral Policy Center. They still had a need to, to gain support for one another. The Cerebral Policy Association had encouraged them to begin their own organization. So that's exactly what they did. My first meeting um, was in 1966. And, or maybe if I can remember about 15 other family members in the room, the parents, um, many of them who've been told to place their children in an institutional, in an institutionalized setting, decided not to do that, and that they could do a good job by keeping them at home and starting those services. So that's how I particularly entered the scene. Um, that was my first meeting, and I remember sitting in the front row, feeling absolutely wonderful to no longer be alone, and there was one other mom who was there for the first night with me. And the president, his name was John Monty, and he had the guts to say, well, we're going to start our own program, who will volunteer? Well, I put my hand in the air, because I was pretty excited to be there. And I didn't know it was the only hand in the air. And I invited Dick to become part of my committee. And then I called my dad, who's a superintendent of schools in North Colony, to be part of the committee, and my mom. And then. Um, because Dick and I had been teaching at the um, Hemigrail Elementary School in Belmar, um, we also reached out to some of the people who taught there and um, decided, well, we really could do this. So this very, very teeny little group of parents um, said, well, 
you decide how to start the programs. Uh, I can I very shortly we could start a preschool that could evolve into a school and a recreation program and family support type of program, uh, summer day camp program. But after all, this wonderful organization has seventy-five dollars in the bank, and what can you do with seventy-five dollars and no state funding? So John Monty says, "Well, no." you go ahead and start those programs and we'll find the money. So that group of parents decided to sell Tootsie Roll canisters. So for a number of years, the parents start, started by selling Tootsie Roll canisters. We raised $7,500 the first year of, from Tootsie Roll, and that was our budget. And with that $7,500 and borrowed facilities from North Colony School District and the First Presbyterian Church, we started Camp Wildwood in July Wildwood School in October, and then what was then called the first recreation program, called the Buddy Program, um, that incorporated whole families, siblings and moms and dads and everybody, and that all started also in October. So it was a pretty busy year, and because of all the Tootsie Rolls canisters that we had to store, most of the families couldn't put their cars in their garages for several years because those garages were full of Tootsie Rolls. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how long I got gone. It was just pure luck meeting the right person at the right time. As Isabel and I have talked about mm -hmm. this, Kevin was three and a half. At the same time, my mother happened to be an avid um, dialing for dollars. Uh -huh. It was a TV program sure. with John Stewart. And didn't she see Ginny on Dialing for Dollar Show? <laughs> so between the both information and a phone number, I contacted um, Carrie Larson. And that was the beginning of a home training program for three and four year olds. One hour a week, which was a pure vacation for me. I thought it was wonderful. I met other mothers who felt just like I did and were going through the same things. And it was just the highlight of my week to be there for one hour. You happened to see an ad in the paper. Um, and it said, new, new home training program. I forgot the wording. And it mentioned um, Wildwood's name. And I said, wow, you know, for kids with developmental disability. I called and also spoke to Carrie Larson. And um, she invited us to come in. And I remember that, that first day when Michael was just about going on three, that I was carrying him, he resisted any touching, we went up a flight of stairs in that little church, and we walked up these stairs, and I instantly felt I was being met by a fairy godmother, and I got a warm smile that said, here you are, and nice to meet you, you must be Kathy, you must be Michael, and up we went, and I was never alone again. I think as parents, you, you just can't give up on your child, no matter what the doctor um, says. As I and Michael and Jim and our family got more familiar with Wildwood and, and into the programs, we got our confidence back. Mm -hmm. We started looking at the, the whole picture rather than just half the picture. We were looking at the full side. And with that confidence, for me, I can only speak for me and my family, with that new confidence about being really right on top of things and they were looking ahead, um, the advocacy then started to come more naturally. The advocacy grows in a parent when you see your son or daughter's ego just going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And you just, sure. it reminds me of that uh, newscaster movie where the guy stands up, he's like, I'm just not going to take any more, <laughs> yeah. you know, that type of thing. Yes. And, and you, just, like, you get out there, and no matter what your own personality is, uh, you go out and you, you be as strong and as, as, as you can. Well, I cannot imagine what our life would be like without Wildwood. He is a very, very sociable, independent young man. I, I could not, I don't even want to think about what my life would be like without Wildwood and where he's at today. It's wonderful. I wouldn't have a lot of stage in our lives and for her to be interacting all the time with other people and going to a job and going out to Rick and 
coming back and forth to home, yet she can go on vacation with us, but she has friends at work, she has friends at the group home, and she she's very sociable. She loves all the things that she does, and she's very well taken care of, and I can't imagine if we didn't have Wildman in our lives, what whether she would have had any of those opportunities. It's scary to think of, of that. So very grateful to Wildwood. Um, um, Wildwood has given us life, um, and Michael now lives in the supported apartment in Albany by himself. He's an artist. He works for the Senate. He jogs. He walks. He smiles. He hugs me. He makes me feel that he's he's invited me into his life. Without Wildwood to have to have given me ideas for that to happen, and the stations along the way for us to go and rest and work at, we'd be constantly searching for the things that Michael might have been able to do, but never had the chance to do because nobody might have believed in him. So. Wildwood has given us hope and belief. And we can love our son for what he is and not for what he isn't, which might not have happened as easily had we not had others to share in those is's. The other day, um, Gov, Gov is Keith's stepfather. And a, and a wonderful man. And I said to, to go coming home from Keith's, Keith would have been really somebody. And he said to me, he is somebody. And he is somebody because he lives at Wildwood, he has a family. When he comes back to his house, and we turn the corner and there's Keith's house, and Keith says, yay, Delmar. And that's so wonderful because I know he's happy going home uh, to his house. He has a life. He's helped channel mine. He's given more than he's taken away. And you can't say more of any human being if they give more to life. Than okay. <laughs> Um, I don't know where David would be in his life if it weren't for Wildwood and the people involved with Wildwood. Um, I might point now, this very happy point in our lives, where even David's sister can feel um, a, kind of a new rebirth of being David's sister. Um, to see her brother get married and to see the tenderness between David and his new wife, Kathleen, um, who is legally blind, and to see the tenderness and the forethought, um, all of the things that we have tried to give David all of our lives and have given David all of our lives, he is now taking and he is turning that around and giving to his wife <laughs> and his new family. So it is really, really beautiful. And I just think that without Wildwood, every single step of the way, I mean, it's been a very, very long, tough journey. David works. He holds down um, a part-time job at Eddie's Aquarium. Um, he's known and cared for in his neighborhood. It's a circle of friends that we never thought that we would see David have, that they do things with, um, double date with, things like the rest of us do. I mean, David is very, very much a part of life. He has a life by finding him so terrifically enjoyable to be with. Because mm -hmm. he's happy. Mm -hmm. He's happy. That's our history. I mean, our history is, you know, except no. Everything is possible. Move on. Think about it and ponder it and just find all the people that are going to believe in it.